Well, I want, at first, I, I really do want to express my appreciation that you took it seriously. I mean, I think you did. And you, you gave folks the benefit of the doubt and you actually went out there and, and looked at some evidence. Um, and so that's great. As far as, you know, my initial reaction, you know, much of the evidence um, is, is difficult to decipher, honestly, through the computer from such a distance. And, uh, you know, some things I could speak to very easily, like some, there are some things I could say, you know, that is not evidence of CAT, um, where folks were, were suggesting it was. I can certainly speak a bit to, their nat to the natural history of cats, so some things that folks are getting slightly wrong about um, at least the species I work with, which is mountain lions or pumas, as they were referred to in the, in the film. Um, so, I mean, I can offer some insights that might be useful, but um, yeah. overall, yeah, overall, I thought you did great. It would, be, it would be great to just get a little bit of background about uh, your expertise uh, and what service you provide. Um, sure. Um, I am a researcher, so I, I'm a scientist, a field biologist. I focus almost exclusively on mountain lions, pumas, cougars, catamounts, the, the, you know, the cat of many, many names. Um, it is native to the Americas, so both North and South America, ranging from Canada all the way to the tip of South America. Um, it's a widespread species. I've studied it across the full extent of their range. Um, I've been working with mountain lions about 20 years. The other thing that actually is pertinent to this film is I, I do a lot with wildlife tracking. I'm very interested in footprints and um, fecal matter and other signs of animal presence um, and in fact do quite a bit of training for everything from private citizens to state agencies um, and I've also provided trainings to state agencies in how to, to identify a cat kill versus a dog or um, some other, you know whether it's a natural mortality from disease or some other thing so that it helps their staff um, in differentiating cat or predator kill from natural kill for compensation programs, for deciding whether to give out a depredation permit, which provides the landowner permission to kill the predator that killed their dog or sheep or whatever it was, um, and also helps with some of the depredation around bighorn sheep in California and things like that. That's kind of who I am or what I bring. Um, I am also the director of the mountain lion program or the puma program for Panthera, which is a global cat conservation organization that works around the world. So um, when you, firstly, let's just tackle um, the, the idea at, at large. So the idea that there could be um, wild kind of pumas that may have lived, lived on or bred from... Uh, you know, being released from captivity. Is this something that's a possibility in any kind of form? Um, essentially, the question being whether there's a could be an existing breeding population that self-perpetuates on the landscape. And uh, I'd say that is incredibly unlikely. And so that, um, that only, so that not only is expecting that there's enough whatever you're talking about, pumas or leopards or whatever the big cat is in question, to find each other, mate, produce young, um, that, that these animals are proficient in hunting. Um, that they, Remember, these animals aren't born killing machines. They actually have to learn some skills and refine their skills as they go on in their lives. And so the possibility that either whether they were escaped um, or what you referred to as the indigenous theory that they were, they've always been there um, is incredibly unlikely. Um, but to, but just to play the devil's advocate, you know, one of the great things that happened in the United States is uh, so mountain lions were wiped out in the Eastern half of our country by European settlers as they moved westward, um, except this tiny population that lived in the swamplands of southern Cal of southern Florida. And what was amazing yeah. about it is that these pumas, who are now called Florida panthers, same animal, just to make sure everyone's clear on that, it's, uh, 
um, they survived decades without anyone knowing they were there because it was so inaccessible, um, such you know, gnarly terrain for walking, hiking, building condominiums, building retiree communities filled with mosquitoes and alligators and all sorts of other things that they literally survived there for decades without anyone knowing. And, you know, there'd be the odd sighting um, that was discredited. And it came to the point where they were listed as endangered and uh, by the federal government, the state pushed back and said, you know, no way, we're not going to follow some regulatory process that limits our ability to build retirement communities and mini malls because you're saying they're still here. Um, and it was a, a private organization that stepped in and hired a mountain lion hunter from Texas to go there with his hunting dogs to see if he could find a, a puma or a, a Florida panther. Yeah. And he did eventually tree one and it was a real cat. Uh, in pretty rough conditions, and they were listed thereafter and protected. But I share that just because, you know, it. there is the possibility that you can have a landscape that is so inaccessible uh, that cats could survive. It's got to be big. And in that, in that particular case, let's say that they had gone undetected for another 10, 15 years, they would have all been gone. They were all, they were so close to disappearing because of the need for a certain number of cats to persist on the landscape to be a self-perpetuating population. Um, they needed a lot of them. Otherwise, inbreeding, just the lack of ability to find each other, uh, drives the population down on its own. So if you're talking 10 cats, like, I mean, I heard someone in your film say, you know, there might be 10 cats in our forest. That is not enough to create a population that can sustain itself. Um, so that's just on the basic biology side. And then the other part is just that, uh, personally, I think that today with cameras and so many people everywhere, and the UK being even denser than, than we are in the United States, or at least out in the Western United States, that the possibility that cats could live in between you without being leaving very obvious signs that accumulates over time is, you know, almost absurd. You know, they leave a lot of sign when they live in a landscape. Mm. Basically, if you if you haven't actually, you know, had kind of an experience yourself, it's quite a difficult case to argue against someone who's new to the new to the sort of subject. Right. Um, but is there? I can see that you're kind of being very sort of generous and kind to the subject. You're saying something like this to happen in in a landscape like the UK, you know. We would just know about this kind of thing by now um, through you know various forms. Yeah, I do believe that. Um, so again, you know, we have had something similar in the United States that I can share. Again, it just provides some context. Or so we we see tons and tons of sightings, thousands of sightings of mountain lions um, throughout the northeast of our country, um, where they have been extirpated for a hundred years and yet they continue every year to receive a thousand sightings across you know New England and Pennsylvania and all of these areas and so people have wondered you know are they there and all the same theories have come up that just as you presented everything from conspiracy and it's a government cover-up to um, the, their released animals to um, it's a breeding population. They've always been here. They were never actually wiped out. All of these exact same things have been raised in that part of the country. And so, I mean, there are still, the debate is on. The, the, the sightings continue. The debate continues. But one of the things that was really well done was the U.S. Fish and Wildlife. So it's our federal wildlife agency conducted a review of the evidence um, back in 2005. And th the person who did it, Mark McCullough, did a wonderful job of really sifting through the information. By that time, genetic um, sort of tools were available, which have really revolutionized how we assess evidence on the landscape. And so, for instance, you know, in the cases where there was fur or poop or something that they could get genetic evidence of, now not all of those um, actually were they were able to amplify genetic material from, but that from which they could, one third of the cats were from South America. And you say, whoa, 
you know, what does that mean? Well, what that means is that they they were released, you know, that they're from um, exotic pet owners, from zoos, from whatever, just like you brought up that that could happen there. Um, he also was able to verify about 110 actual sightings. Like there was real evidence of mountain lions in New England at least 100 times and more. And uh, his, his conclusion was that these are not native animals. They didn't live, they're not, uh, they haven't always been here. It's that they, they were either released animals and then you do get the rare dispersal event, which, you know, is a cat from the Western United States traveling a long way, the most exciting story being 2011 when there was a cat killed in Connecticut and was estimated for, from genetics they could determine he came from South Dakota, which is about 1,700 miles of a loop to get to. It's an incredible distance, but it's possible. So, I mean, we're a little bit different. It's, it'd be a whole other thing to say, is it possible for the cat to get to Connecticut and then swim the Atlantic Ocean to the UK? Now, that that's probably not realistic, but... Um, but it does raise these questions again, you know? Yeah, and, um, but I, the reason I bring that up too is that, again, trying to be generous, that one of the things Mark McCullough's report did is it said, you know, at least 110 times, there's really a mountain lion in New England. Now it may be a released animal, but it was a mountain lion. So if someone said they saw a mountain lion, they really did, at least 110 times. Um, and so the, the possibility certainly exists, just as you bring up in your film, that animals escape from time to time or are released purposefully. And uh, meaning that they, you know, an owner just is overwhelmed. Uh, I'm not thinking that they're trying to start a population, but more just like, my God, taking care of a mountain lion is way bigger than I thought it would ever be. And so I'm going to let the cage open one night. Um, and so animals do occasionally appear in the landscape in unexpected places. And um, and so people may occasionally see a mountain lion or a leopard or a jaguar or, or a lynx or something that isn't supposed to be there. Um, but that is a very different thing than saying there's a native or a breeding population that is self-perpetuating on the landscape. Do you have, um, is it easy to kind of put a figure on, on how, what kind of numbers you would need in order to constitute uh, sort of a thriving breeding population? Oh, gosh. Um, you know, I'd say that the bare minimum would be 50 just to see breeding and all that kind of happening, but that's not genetically healthy. You would need several hundred to get kind of actually um, self-perpetuate over decades. Um, the You know, a, a group of 50 would eventually um, fall apart because... In a, in a country like the UK, so you have to, you know, there's so many things that, you know, are interesting to think about. How much territory is covered by a big cat? They have absolutely massive territories. So if you're actually talking about a, a functioning cat population, that means that there are males holding territories that range from 250 to 800 square kilometers, um, which is sizable. And cats, uh, females, you know, being sort of littered within each of the male's home ranges that have perhaps 80 to 200 square kilometer home ranges. And these are massive areas. And if you just look at the size of the forest that you're talking about in your film, these wild landscapes that are left in the UK, and then you say, well, how many cats could you jam in a natural forest that is only 50 kilometers square? Well, the answer is one or zero. You know, and so if you got more than that in there, there there are issues. We know in the United States we have areas that are as small as 650 square kilometers with breeding mountain lions in them. Um, for instance, the Santa Monica population near LA, which is in serious trouble, genetic, seriously in trouble. There's also all these weird, not just inbreeding issues, but um, you get behavioral changes and it's almost like the population begins to implode on itself because there's no way to expand or grow. And you see all this unnatural killing, males killing their own kittens, things like that. Um, so when an animal population is so small and so jammed in, it can't expand, whether that's from urban or suburban sprawl all around it, which would certainly be the case in some parts of England, um, that that's the kind of thing you would see. And 
you know, these, these cats are not invisible. People get photos of them all the time on their trail cameras. There's footprints all over. There's animals, you know, dying, the, you know, goats and llamas and things in people's backyards because they've got this tiny population bumping up against it. And that's what you would see in the UK if you had a, a tiny population trying to survive. And in that mountain range, I'm trying to remember the number, I might get it a bit wrong, but 650 square kilometers, roughly, is the actual park of the Santa Monica Mountains. So you've got, of course, land next to it that's privately owned, so it's a bit bigger. And that has maybe 12 mountain lions. You know, it probably goes up and down depending on how many are dying at a time. And they're dying on the roads all the time, which would be your first major evidence in the UK. Um, look at Florida, it'd be a gr another great example. So Florida has these huge landscapes in the south, big swamplands, the, the Cypress National Parks, and all these of this, the famous parks of the southeast of the United States that are large, contiguous tracks that could, as islands, host a couple of cats. Um, and the second they go beyond them, they die. They, they lose about, you know, sometimes 25% of the population on roads every year because of the density of people and the density of roads. And cats just aren't good at crossing roads. They're, I mean, I mean that seriously. They just, uh, they die on roads very easily in comparison to say wolves or foxes or, or coyotes or um, other predators. They just aren't as good at crossing roads. That's true of bobcats, lynx, um, and, and numerous cat species. So yeah, anyways, there's some things to ponder.